excited to finally be here with you. Welcome everybody to TEDx. So great to have you here. Um, you know, I've been swimming in this world of sustainability every day, uh, all week long and all year long, and for decades now actually. So let me be the first to tell you, sustainability is one hot mess. It is a hot mess, and it's getting hotter all the time. It's a confusing, contested concept. There's no doubt about it. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, you know, <laughs> we wrestle with this every day, but the reason why we're so excited about it is because we know it's the right thing to do. We know it's extremely important, and maybe it's because of this urgency, or maybe it's because of the fact that we're not taught to think and live in a truly interconnected way that we're starting to see the emergence of all kinds of concepts that are clothed in sustainability, but they just ain't it, right? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but before I get there, let me just start out with where, where I came from, right? So when I first got into this, this is what I was all about, right? No compromise in defense of Mother Earth. That's where I started, and that still resonates with me. <laughs> Every day I still feel that, right? That passion, that ability to be compassionate for a planet that we all depend on, right? It's so cool, it's so important. But as I started the actual work of doing this defending of Mother Earth, I quickly came to realize that it can't just be that. That it's also about justice for other people. And in fact, that we, the people, are an inherent part of Mother Earth. We share this ecosystem with everything else on this planet. And so protecting Mother Earth is also about protecting us. And so now this is where I'm at. A crazy balancing act called sustainability. Because true sustainability and true defense of Mother Earth is about seeking balance and seeing the connections, right? But instead of being taught to understand the complex interconnections which truly define our world, there's no way we can get around it. Instead, we're taught to break things down, right? We're taught to break things down into simple problems that fit within disciplines that we go to study. And that may work in a classroom. It may be very useful in a classroom, actually. But it's no way to build a sustainable society. We need to recognize that sustainability requires us to do all of these things at once. It requires us to pay attention to not only the ecology, but humanity. It's about just as much about reducing injustice and abuse as it is about getting rid of waste and pollution and protecting Mother Earth, right? And it's also about recognizing limits, my God. I'm not talking about limits for human potential or creativity now. I'm talking about things like ecological limits, right? Economic limits. We cannot have sustainability in a world built on infinite economic growth. We can't, we have to accept that. Because this is where infinite economic growth has gotten us. This is the state we're in. Basically since the late 60s or so, we as a species have been living far beyond our means. It's as though we were adolescents in the 60s and somebody gave us a credit card and we started maxing it out every day with no ability to pay back. Unfortunately, who we owe isn't the Bank of America, it's ourselves. It's our common future. This is totally unsustainable and we need to do something about it. How did we get to that place though? I believe we got there because we didn't see the connections. We don't see the results of our choices. And we don't know some really basic facts. It is so easy to live in a very privileged place like this and to eat without having any idea where that food came from or how it came to you, where it was grown, how it was grown, who toiled in the hot sun under basically modern slavery conditions to get it to you. And maybe we're more conscious consumers. Maybe we think, okay, I'm buying organic. We don't realize that this might be what an organic farm looks like in the Central Valley of California where a lot of our organic produce comes from. It may use less chemicals, but it's still a highly industrial system dependent on not diversity at all, <laughs> but monocultures using possibly fossil water that's not renewable and dependent mostly 
on all kinds of people who are really marginalized in our society, certainly not paid living wages, but they don't even have a job. They just show up in the Walmart parking lot every morning, a bus comes to pick them up, to pay them pennies an hour, and that bus pulls their toilets behind them because that's the law. We don't know where our water comes from, people. Our food and our water. You know, we, how can you be an adult in this world, much less a children going to school, and not have any idea where the basic things that sustain you come from? But this is the case, right? We don't realize, a lot of us don't know where our water comes from or where it goes. Well, here in Louisville, it comes from the Ohio River. And we do a great job of treating that water. Louisville has award-winning tap water, actually. We're really blessed with an abundance of fresh water in this town. Certainly not something to complain about compared to other places. But we use that same river as our sink, too. That's where our water goes. Which, on a day like this, is fine. We have a sewage treatment plant that can handle that. But on a day when there's some rain, we've got some rain coming in the forecast, we're going to be sending raw sewage out to the Ohio River. Basically, we're taking a crap on our friends down in Paducah, OK? <laughs> we would not do that if our friends from Paducah were right here. UofL's taken some steps to disconnect our downspouts and actually capture rainwater for our useful reuse, like we do at our garden commons, or to get it where it should be going, which is into our groundwater. Simple thing we can do today. We don't know where our waste goes, right? We throw stuff away all the time. There is no way. We all know that. Maybe some of us are more conscious and we think, that I'm going to do something good for the planet. I'm going to recycle. I'm not saying you shouldn't recycle, but you know, maybe we can do without producing that waste in the first place. We got mountains of recyclables that we don't know what to do with, and that take a lot of energy, a lot of climate changing energy usually, just to process and reuse. So maybe we could give up bottled water. Maybe we could pledge to do that today and say, I'm never going to take another pre-bottled water ever. I'm going to bring my own vessel and fill it up with Louisville's award-winning tap so I don't have to produce any waste ever again. You can choose to do that today. We don't know where our energy comes from. What's keeping the lights on? I ask that on campus all the time. People have no idea. Well, around here, it comes from blowing up people's backyards in Appalachia, right? obliterating beautiful mountains that have sustained cultures of people and other species for decades and eons, right? This is our heritage. We're wiping it off the map right now. And it's not just Appalachia, it's right here in Louisville. Once we take that coal out of the ground, where do we burn it? Well, what's keeping the lights on right now is our Cane Run coal-fired plant making mountains of coal ash that blows on the neighbors all day long. Not to mention the carbon emissions that go into the air and change our climate and make it impossible for us to sustain life on this planet. And where is that plant located? Oh, it's in Western Louisville, where there's some poor people and some non-white people, you know. <laughs> That's where our power's coming from. And then we go to the store and we love to buy things. We want cheap stuff, right? Everybody wants cheap stuff. Why is that stuff so cheap? Because we've cheapened humanity. We've cheapened life. We don't know the people who toil all day long for next, next to nothing to make the stuff we want and buy. We don't know, we don't hear the stories of the families whose relatives were crushed in Bangladesh, 1,100 people in one incident, or incinerated to death in these factories that are just totally inhumane. You know, to understand all this and what we could do about it, I got to give a shout out to one of my favorite podcasts. Anybody like Radio Lab? Oh, man, check it out. They did a great show recently about buttons. A lot of their talk was about the button, the button to launch nuclear war, right? So those of us who grew up during the Cold War, you know, this was top of mind. What if, what if somebody accidentally hit that button and we launched nuclear winter, right? Wiped up life off this planet. Well, the truth was there was no actual button. What there was was a bunch of launch codes kept in a briefcase chained to a presidential assistant who never left the president's side, right? Well, Roger Fisher in 1981 came up with a great idea about how we could help get away with, from this problem where it was just too easy to launch this nuclear war, right? Even with that system, it's too easy. So he said, why don't we take those launch codes, put them in a capsule, and implant it in the heart of a volunteer? 
And instead of carrying around a briefcase with the codes, he carries around a briefcase with a butcher knife. And if the president wanted to launch nuclear war, he could take that knife out, butcher an innocent victim right in front of him, blood on the White House carpet, and launch a war that would result in the loss of millions of innocent lives, right? Well, the Pentagon rejected this idea outright. Why? Because it would work. Because they knew the president wouldn't do that. And I think it's the same way with all of the impacts we have. If those people, if those victims were right here in front of us, we probably wouldn't make those choices. But because they're not, we've got all this disconnected thinking. We want to do the right thing, but we don't really know maybe how or who the victims would be if we didn't do the right thing. So we come up with all of these things that kind of muddy the waters. And we can write books about them, <laughs> right? We cannot shop our way to sustainability, y'all. We cannot shop our way to sustainability. We've got to do some fundamental things to change the things that sustain us, right? It's not about taking the old way and tinkering around the edges. We need some fundamental change. Greening the US military, really? That is not going to get us to sustainability, people. We need to find a way to not need that military. So we come up with these concepts like environmental sustainability. What? That's one leg of a three-legged stool, right? That thing is going to topple real quick. There's no such thing as sustainability for just the environment. OK, we got to think about justice for people and an economic system that makes sense. And then my favorite one, oh, zero emission vehicles. Whoo, yeah, we're going to save the day with this, right? <laughs> what would Jesus drive? That's, that's the question of the day. <laughs> no. First of all, they're not zero emissions. It's just the emissions are somewhere else. So you're taking a, a gas-fired vehicle, and you're, you're making it a coal-powered vehicle. And those emissions are coming out in West Louisville, right? or partial zero emission vehicle. I love that one. But even if we were fixing the emissions problem, we got a whole bunch of other problems we need to deal with, right? That these cars are not the solution for. Sedentary diseases are killing us, right? Think about what cars have done to our cities. They are literally clogging our veins. This is downtown Louisville, y'all, in red surface parking lots and purple parking decks. Cars are clogging our veins of our bodies and our cities. We need to think about true solutions, true zero emission vehicles. You want a zero emission vehicle? Get on one of these, right? <laughs> Not only are you gonna get rid of the emissions, but you're gonna have some fun doing it. You're gonna get healthy, both physically and mentally. And you're gonna reshape our cities. You're gonna slow traffic. Bikes don't threaten anybody. One in 70 deaths in America is because of a car. Not on a bicycle. You're gonna reshape our cities, much less pavement, right? So the stormwater can go where it needs to go. Oh, this is the way to do it. Now, we can also get off fossil fuels today. And when we think about doing that, we think about solar solutions, right? And we think about maybe these kind of higher tech, higher investment solutions, like the guilt-free hot showers we have at the Student Rec Center now at UofL because of a solar hot water heater or the, the PV panels on the roof of my home, which provide 100% of my electricity. But you know, we don't have to start here because this might not be available to everybody today. We can start here, right? Every single one of us can afford to use the power of the sun to do things that fossil fuels used to do. Every one of us can afford a solar clothes dryer instead of a coal powered clothes dryer, right? Sustainable solutions don't necessarily cost more. They just cost time and attention and knowledge and thinking and living interconnected. And while you're out there tapping the power of the sun, why don't you plant something, please? Plants are amazing things. <laughs> they take sunlight and they turn it into stuff we absolutely vitally need every single day, whether it's oxygen, food, fuel, fiber, wood. My god, they take carbon out of the atmosphere. Let's plant some plants, y'all, and let's do it in community together like we do here at UofL's Garden Commons so we can learn from one another and start rebuilding those connections and rethreading the fabric of society. And when we're done eating, Interconnected thinking requires that we don't send our food waste to the landfill where it's going to turn into methane, a very powerful greenhouse gas, but instead we send it to the worms for composting so that we can keep those valuable nutrients, return them to the soil, and restore the balance that we are disrupting every single day. So my message to you all is to think when you leave here, how can I live interconnected? 
How can I find that sweet, compassionate spot in the middle where I pay attention not just to my impact on this wonderful planet we all depend on, but on the other people we depend on as well? Thank you all so much.